all three presentations were really interesting. Um, I mean, maybe just to take a couple, a couple of points. Um, I agree with Johanna very much that these capacity issues are absolutely critical. And of course, the resolution of that problem is that you have to build capacity as part of the process. And you know, so we can't treat capacity as though it's a sort of separate or standalone issue. Growth is absolutely critical um, as, as well. I, you know, I, th I think we can take it as given that a society that doesn't grow over time is not going to succeed in uh, accelerating human development over time <coughs> either. Um, there are a couple of areas of um, disagreement as well, inevitably. Um, for, first of all, the, the first MDG isn't on growth, it's on poverty reduction. And growth is a means to that end. But poverty reduction is a function of two things. It's a function of the average increase in income and the, increment, and the share of any increment in income that's captured by people who are in poverty. And that is a distributional <coughs> question. And I, I would say, you know, we, we, if we're concerned about poverty reduction, we have to look at both sides of the equation and not just one side of the equation. The reason that countries like Vietnam have been much more successful in converting growth into poverty reduction than many other countries, including Kenya, I suspect, although the data is a bit lacking for Kenya, is because in the early growth stages, it was a, a much more equitable society. Um, and another issue of fact, it, it's not true that Brazil is becoming more unequal. It, Brazil is becoming less unequal. The Gini coefficient has dropped from about 53 to 48 in the last... Yeah, I didn't say that. You did say that. Let's talk about China. Well, I was going to come on to China because the, 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 the factual error on China that you mentioned, that you know, the focus in China has been on growth so far. I mean, if you listen to political debates in China the political leadership is obsessively concerned with rising inequality in China. And actually China has a much lower level of inequality, ironically, than Kenya. Uh, and yet you have a political leadership that's much more concerned about inequality than we see, in, uh, I, I think, in some, some of the debates in, um, in, in Kenya. So though those inequality issues do matter um, a great deal, and I think the international evidence is unequivocal that that you, you can get both sides of this right. You can become more equitable and you, you can be a more dynamic society at the same time. Um, Ali raised a number of, I, I think, really interesting and important questions. You, you use one phrase, which is that we need to ensure that the most talented are able to move forward. And I think all of us would believe, you know, I think we, we should aspire towards a meritocratic society and a society in which there's equal opportunity. And a society with equal opportunity, I mean, if you think about it in a sort of theoretical way, is a society in which you can't predict an outcome. That is to say, if you took a child that's born to a rich household in Nairobi and a child that's born to a poor household in Tokana, in a genuinely equal society, you wouldn't know which one of them would be, let's say, more likely to survive to the age of five would be more likely to go to secondary school, would be more likely to have a prosperous adult life, and that sort of thing. In unequal societies, these things are very predictable. You can predict failure pretty much at birth. And, and I'm afraid, if you look at a society like Kenya, you can predict with near certainty that a young girl who is born in Takana or Wajir is not going to go to university in this country. Of course, some do. But the percentage chance, you know, you're in the sort of one to le less than one percentile. Whereas if you're born to a rich urban household and you're a male, the probability goes up to 30 or 40 percent. Now, you, this is, you know, I've, I've visited schools in Takana where kids are learning with notebooks under trees, and I've visited private schools in Nairobi. Um, and so this is a society, you know, which is, dis which is skewing the distribution of opportunity in ways that I, I think are profoundly damaging for equity but profoundly damaging for economic growth as well, because there's an awful lot of talent and potential that's being written off in this country. Um, and I think it's not just about targeted intervention. It's, it's about getting the whole public spending system right to sort of facilitate more equal opportunity. I, I would be very interested to know whether what the bank perspective is. I, I haven't read the latest economic update. But what the bank perspective is 
on the current formula that's being debated, which attaches quite a low weight, around 20%, to poverty in the way that resources would be allocated, and a much bigger percentage to um, population. I mean, my own, my own view is you, you, if you invert, you could almost invert that formula in the ways that many countries would and say this would look more equitable. You know, many of the most successful countries, you know, whether you're talking about India, Brazil, Ethiopia or China, have very strongly redistributed programs in their public spending. And I do think these models are very important for Kenya. And, uh, and I'll end with that at Etienne's point. I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head that really this is a debate about citizenship in a way. And I think you know, what drove the new constitution was a concern across Kenyan society that something was fundamentally wrong and some, you know, that something had to be corrected. And it, it was very interesting for me, actually, that uh, I worked on the Kofi Annan Africa Progress Report this year. Um, and on the panel that did the report, we had Strive Masewa, who was a very successful businessman, as, as many people will know. And the, what both Strive and Mr. Annan were absolutely emphatic about, right from the beginning, was about, was about inequality in Africa of saying you know, that for too long we've brushed this issue under the table. And Strive's argument was you know, that we're writing off the talents of so many children because we're tolerating inequalities in education, in nutrition, in access to health care. We're, you know, we're not facing up to them. And we're talking about growth. And we're celebrating the growth of the past decade. And we're allowing these, these much more fundamental constraints on the development of citizenship and more inclusive societies to be uh, swept under the carpet. And I think this meeting here is a very positive sign that you know, we're not sweeping things under the carpet here and we're, we're debating them openly. The top-down trickle-down uh, kind of thinking having been uh, disproven. But I'm also thinking about uh, that same kind of inequality for decision-making. It's something we don't pay attention to too much, uh, somewhat related to what Rose was saying. But uh, the people need to be involved a lot more. Part of the growth you see in China, Brazil, and India is because they're allowing their people a lot more say, right from the grassroots, in directing how money is spent, how resources are allocated, and what are the priorities the people themselves believe to be um, most urgent. Thank you. Uh, Good morning. My name is Peter. I'm an economist and uh, with interest in the public policy. My contribution on the debate about uh, growth and equity, I think, in my opinion, I think it's a uh, it's a battle between the rich and the poor. And uh, I want just to give an example, like the financial sector, and be able to see whether we are really serious when we are talking about uh, these two issues, and whether we are willing to go extra mile to make sure that we have equity in our growth. If we are going to uh, declare profits of uh, 12 billion from the financial sector, for example, where is this money coming from? And then the people who are banking with the financial sector, what do they get out of that share? So in terms of addressing equity, yes, we have growth. The financial sector is growing well. But how is it uh, generating that growth? It's by robbing the poor. So for us to be able to address uh, growth and to be able to have a trickle down to the, the, to the population, then we have to have some good regulatory framework that guarantees that the majority of the poor can be able to access um, a financial uh, support within the at least the cost, um, um, uh, within the, the, uh, the lowest uh, interest levels that are possible. The other aspect of it is uh, in terms of contribution uh, to the economic growth, because it's by contributing that you can be rewarded. And then we are looking at the majority of the Kenyans being the youth. Then what kind of uh, factor inputs do they want? They don't own land, they don't own capital. The only thing that they can be able to have is their skills. So to what extent are we going to empower them to be able to contribute to the economy so that they can be able to get a share of the cake? Because if you don't contribute, then you cannot exact, expect to get an ending from a market economy. So for me, uh, my contribution is that uh, we need to pay a lot of emphasis on uh, equipping the youth with technical skills that they can be able to use them. Uh, and developing the, the brain growth skills so that they can be able to contribute to the economy. Thank you.